Thanks so much for joining. I'm, I'm really excited to have you. I think you're one of my first batch of women guests on the podcast. Oh, really? That's really awesome. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. Yeah, of course. How was Canton Fair for starters? Amazing. As usual, you know, Canton Fair has really grown over the years and China has made it a lot easier for people to travel. So just so many people there and they've actually built an, an entire um, new hall. Um, so where it used to be like 217 football fields, if you yeah. walked it and they had like 60,000 booths, now they have over 80,000 booths and, um, and it's like something like 270 football fields. Just insane and you know I love seeing Canton Fair through the eyes of um, people who are new to it you know I host trips there and meet entrepreneurs there so it's really cool to see people see it for their first time you know yeah I I, I completely know what you mean I was there for the first time since I think it was like six years ago um, so so it's really changed a lot and, and China has developed nobody takes to cash now Everybody has to use WeChat Pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think what's nice, though, is that, you know, you don't have to use WeChat Pay anymore. You can use Alipay now. And okay, uh, cool. it used to be when we would help people set up for their trip to yeah. China, they had to get a China SIM and a Chinese bank account and everything right. else because nothing worked. And now you can just set up Alipay before you leave and it works Ooh. nearly everywhere. Okay, <laughs> that's really good to know. Yeah, I'll I'll try that for the next time. And I think next time I'm definitely going with you guys. It's I can I can it, it's so overwhelming. Um, and and I can imagine it being so much more fun with a group of people who are like minded, going with the same goal. And I want to yeah. hear more about your ventures. I know you're not only a seven figure seller on Amazon. You've developed a really cool award-winning product that is made in the USA. You also have your own agency and you bring people abroad to shows. I feel like that didn't do it just at all. So I want to hear it from you. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I started, a, I invented a pet product in 2017 and I've been selling on Amazon since 2007 while I was in the military. So I knew that I could launch my product on Amazon and uh, that was really comforting, <laughs> you know, for a new entrepreneur to be oh. able to access a channel like that. And then, you know, of course, in that whole inventing a product process, I got very frustrated because there isn't really a clear path to market. No one has really created a course or steps to kind of walk you through how to actually develop a product from scratch and launch it. Um, so I actually set out on a mission to do that because I was very frustrated. I have an MBA. I'm, you know, a very educated and professional woman. I've done a lot of things in my career and here I couldn't take my prototype and turn it into a product on the market. And I saw a problem with that. And so I just really made it my mission to fill those gaps. And that's how my consulting firm was born. And, um, and also I own a couple of trade shows as well. Now I, I founded the only multi-category, the Canton Fair of Latin America um, wow. two years ago. And then I also have one in Jordan. Um, so I never expected sourcing <laughs> to become yeah. one of my things, but um, it's just been a beautiful journey. And, um, you know, I am so grateful for not only all of the entrepreneurs who've trusted me with their businesses to help them launch their brands, but also, you know, for, for my own journey and, and getting all the opportunities that we have available to us. This evolution really is so fascinating. So it sounds like you had an idea, you invented a product that was selling quite well on Amazon. And then you, and then through that experience as an Amazon seller, you identified these other business opportunities, such as helping other entrepreneurs get started and manage their account and grow and then also trade shows. So how, what are the experiences and the pain points that led you to begin those separate experiences? So actually my consulting firm started before I even left my cybersecurity job. <laughs> so um, I was so frustrated with the process of bringing a product to market. You know, when you have an idea for a product, and you reach out to these like design firms and stuff like that, they all want $30,000 or more to turn your drawing into another drawing. 
<laughs> and then they want another $100,000 for your molds. Then they want another $150,000 to help you with your website and your branding and everything else. And here you are $300,000 in and you don't even have a product yet or you, you don't even, you know, you don't even know what you're doing. And I can't tell you how many design firms I talk to. Uh, I tried out for Shark Tank season 18. Um, I didn't get picked up for the show. I'm grateful for that now because now I have so many opportunities uh, and I didn't have to give up any of my business. But basically also it really, it pissed me off. Yeah. I couldn't believe, you know, there are millions of people in the world with ideas like I had. Mm. And if your only choice, if you have an idea for a prototype is to reach out to one of these design firms that are going to completely rip you off and you might not even have a good idea. You might not have even validated your idea, but you're so in love with your baby that before you know it, you're out $200,000 and you're, you don't have a sale or a hope, right? And so I started my consulting firm um, basically out of necessity. So I started learning everything. I was cold calling manufacturers. I built my own 3D printer. Like this was all while I still had a full-time job. And I was just, I had a mission. I wanted to help as many people as I could because I was like, if I'm an educated woman with a six figure job in cybersecurity and I can't figure out how to get a prototype to a product on the market and you can hear how passionate I am about this, um, then there's a problem. And I was just like, I'm going to make it my mission in life to help other people on this path. And so I started making videos. I started learning things. Whatever I learned, I shared. And before I knew it, people started asking to consult with me. And I was like, no, I don't do that. I'm not a business consultant. I'm literally still at my full-time job. I'm just trying to launch a product, right? Um, I'm just here to help, you know? I'm, I just know other people have ideas. And so finally I said yes. I was like, fine, you know, give me 50 bucks. I'll meet you on Google Hangouts. I'll try to help you, you know? Well, I, those people that I helped initially, I was a big help to. And many of them reached six figures in a month very quickly with my help. And, um, and they started spreading the word. And yeah. then I had so many people asking me to help them. And here I was, I, I didn't even leave my job yet. I still was like launching my business, doing everything. And I was on coaching calls. Literally, I'd get home from work and I'd be on coaching calls till 10 o'clock at night. And I'd do it all over again the next day. So really, it wasn't like me seeking these opportunities. It was like, I just wanted to help. And before I knew it, it just kind of happened. And by the time I left my job in October of 2018, I literally had so much work. I was turning people down. And, um, and I had launched my brand by then. And, you know, I was selling by then um, in private label, you know. Um, and so that's kind of how it happened. And then I started hosting trips to the Canton Fair. Uh, as part of that, I was building a community of sellers. And before I knew it, um, these other opportunities like the trade shows came about. Um, and uh, yeah, it just kind of kind of happened. <laughs> I think it's super cool. It, it sounds very unintentional, but at the same time, it makes so much sense that it grew in that organic order. And I, and I think it's so, I 100% agree with the prototyping part. My family has a factory in China near Guangzhou, and it's surprisingly difficult to prototype and expensive. We use 3D printing services and they charge like, they charge like 200 bucks per drawing converted from 2D graphics into into a CAD file for 3D printing. And it's like, you would think that by now with AI and, and all of the new innovations in the world, it would be like pumping out designs like that and, and, and at no cost. And surprisingly, it's very difficult. I think another big issue, um, I don't know if you've, had the same or you would feel the same is I feel like I feel like consumers have a very I think as consumers we we think that products are are printed out like this in the factory but it's so not true it actually takes a lot of time a lot a, a big part of the production process is still manual so I feel like it would be so interesting to see how with the proliferation of AI and data we would be able to produce quicker and, and cheaper going forward. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, 
it, that's one of the reasons I host these sourcing trips around the world. And, you know, I have them in Mexico, in Jordan and in China, and I take people to factories right? because you need to see, like we went to a packaging factory um, th- on this last trip to Kenton Fair and just people understanding, like, I, I remember seeing somebody putting together like a, a production line of chocolate boxes, you know, the heart okay. chocolate boxes. Literally, there are people glue, applying, manually applying glue and putting the paper over the cardboard and sealing it with their fingers, you know, bending wow. the paper over the edges. And I was like, I'm never going to throw away a chocolate box again in my life. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Look at all the hands that went into making this. Wow. And, and, you know, even to like to print a logo on a product, whether it's a screen print and somebody's manually yeah. pad printing, you know, the first time I went to a factory where they were making dirt double vacuum heads um, and dirt double vacuums, you know, all the different processes that went into that injection molding and then the machines that put the bristles in the brushes and, you know, and then literally somebody manually screen printing the pad printing the dirt devil logo on every single vacuum head and that changes you when you think about when you're a brand owner and you see what goes into the production of your products and other people's products you know it changes the way you think it changes your respect for your factories and your you know suppliers your partners Um, it's just, it changes everything. So I would recommend every single entrepreneur, if you have not gone, um, personally to where you're, you're sourcing your products from and visited your factories, you got to do it now because it's, it's just, you, you learn so much. For example, I paid $42,000 for my plastic injection molds, um, for my product that's made in the USA, my, my pet product. And I went through an intermediary in the U.S. who just went to China and had the molds created, right? I went to China myself and I could have gotten those same molds created for about $13,000. So that's the difference of when you actually go yourself and you learn about manufacturing, you learn about your processes, you make connections. It's a huge, it has a huge impact on your business and how you're able to scale and grow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully everybody will think twice before trying to negotiate prices now with the factory <laughs> after seeing how much work and, and sweat and blood goes into the production process. Yeah. And I want to I want to hear more about made in the USA. Usually when I hear that term, I think about things that would be would be unsafe or or perhaps considered you know, not as superior coming from China in the consumer's mind, such as food, for example, or baby products. You invented, it was a cat litter. And, and and is that the product that's being made in the USA right now? Or do you have more? So my product is a litter box cleaner. It's the first okay. of its kind. It's a new category in pets. Um, so I made this product because basically I was tired. I tried all the litter boxes out there. Okay. And, you know, you try the, the sifting litter boxes and it, it, they're just gross. Like all this stuff gets stuck on and now you got to have this thing that you got to take apart and clean. I've tried scooping and I was scooping twice a day, every day. And it was still so, it was so, so stinky and gross. I've tried the automatic litter boxes. They don't work well. The stuff gets stuck on. It's just gross. So most cat people go back to scooping which again, we've already talked about how gross scooping is. So I basically set out to solve this problem. I said, you know, we haven't innovated. When we think about how much we've innovated in human toilets, right? Right. We've got these amazing human toilets that are heated and with days built in and everything, but we're still picking up our dog's poop with a bag on the side of the road, right? Like, we have not innovated on this at all. We're still sifting through a litter box with like searching for treasure turds. I don't know. But (laughs) so I just really wanted to solve this problem. And I sketched litter boxes like for like probably at least six months, I was sketching what I thought was a better litter box. Mm -hmm. But at the core of it, it would be too similar to something I'd already tried that didn't work. And I thought for a while that I was not going to be able to solve it. And, um, 
one morning I woke up at like 2 a.m. and just had a like aha moment. I was like, oh my gosh, it's the litter box that's the problem. Like I need to create something outside of the litter box that I can just dump the litter box into. So I went to Home Depot as soon as it opened, built a prototype and the prototype worked so well. And um, basically, so my, my device is just a big cat litter scoop that sits on top of a bin and you just pick up the litter box and you pour it in and all the waste stays on the top in the big scoop and all the clean litter goes through to the bottom. And what happens is it actually eliminates the odor because when you're scooping or using a sifting litter box and you break up those stinky clumps, it contaminates the rest of the clean litter. So with my product, you can clean up to three litter boxes in under 60 seconds. If you scoop manually, it's going to take you 15 minutes or more, not to mention taking apart a gross automatic litter box and trying to clean it, right? And also, you're able to use the same litter for up to 20 days with no odor, which is incredible. I mean, people are literally subscribing to these litter services that drop off new litter boxes every week. And okay. so much waste is going into the environment. With my product, you're really reducing the amount of waste and you're eliminating that odor and you're making a happy place for your cat and humans are happy too because they don't have to dig and search for treasures in the litter box so that's that's a product i invented and so the part of it that is made in the usa is the big sifter on the top of the product it is um a plastic injection molded product it's made in in texas um and the reason that i made it in texas or in the usa instead of china is because of its size. Mm. So people ask me this all the time. Couldn't you get it cheaper in China? Like, why do you deal with all this made in the USA stuff? And don't get me wrong. Made in the USA is a pain. It okay. is a pain. Like, it's hard to find a manufacturer that will work with you. You have to really know how to pitch your business. You have to know what your projections are. You have to communicate well. You have to be very professional. Um, and that manufacturer that you find is probably producing for a lot of other companies that are much bigger fish than you. Um, and so it's, it's tough. Sometimes my lead times are 13 weeks or longer. Um, it's more expensive. Uh, however, you'll notice that any big plastic products are made in the USA. Okay. And the reason is because of shipping costs. So that's why my product is made in the USA. I would love to say like, oh, I just wanted to go American and it was <laughs> going to be great. Like, of course I would love to go American, but it's, it's honestly, Elsa, I still kit with my family every single product because US manufacturers are not going to kit your products for you. They're not going to put them in packaging. Like mm -hmm. we still kit as a family, every single product. We unload our own containers. We maintain our own warehouse. That's what it looks like if you manufacture in the USA. Wow. It sounds like a family business. It really is. Yes. <laughs> I want to hear a bit more about that process, kidding and then unloading with your family. That sounds, that sounds very cool, but I'm sure it's very hard. Yeah. So, you know, if you source in China, um, you're, if I had sourced this product in China, for example, my factory would be happy yeah. to put the bin and the sifter and the, the poles and the flyer, the information flyer into the box, tape it up, put it on a pallet, whatever. Actually, they don't usually palletize in China. Yeah. They just um, yeah, loose load, right? Put it in a, in a container and ship it overseas, right? Almost um, expected. But, yeah, that's what's expected and that's what you can expect. However, yeah. in the U.S., manufacturers will not do that um, unless you're, I shouldn't say that. That's a blanket statement that I'm making. If you're sourcing supplements, skincare products, you know, those kinds of things, that's no problem. Those are normally white labeled products that are very easy to source in the United States and they already have the packaging processes, all of that. They'll do all that for you. That's fine. Um, but when you have a product like mine, a plastic injection molded product or a product with multiple components, asking your factory to store products for you or to kit them for you and to put everything in the box. That's what I mean by kidding, putting everything in the box and taping it up, um, is something they're not willing to do. And so you would have to find a 3PL, a third party logistics provider or a prep center, and you would have to send all of your components to oh. that third party. 
And the problem is why most US-based businesses that have a US-based manufacturer, why most of us have our own warehouses and everything is because the costs are insane. So right now with my family, I it costs me maybe like 25 cents a unit to put everything in a box, right? And tape it up and you know get it done, right? But with um, going through a 3PL, like if I were to outsource everything, where my factory sends the sifters to a 3PL and then I send the packaging to a 3PL and all of that, um, not only would I have to pay for storage of each of those components at that facility, but I would also have to pay for everything. They charge for everything. They charge for, okay, we're gonna put a sticker on your product, the, sh the shipping label on your product. That's a dollar yeah. to put a sticker on. Like there's no margin, right? Um, so it just, it's every single thing, not only do they charge, they charge to take the box. They charge to, by the time I would get done kidding every unit through a 3PL, it was nearly $6 a unit, including storage, everything else. So I, I couldn't afford to do it, honestly. And, um, you know, like I said, with my family, if I would have done it through a factory in China, it would be about 50 cents a unit, right? Okay. Um, and doing it with my family, it's about 25 cents a unit, including the costs of, of, uh, warehouse that we pay for all of that. Um, right. but yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. And I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news because everybody, you know, I'm on the, on the board in my state's inventors group. And I hear this from inventors all the time, you know, I want to make it in America. Well, yeah. great, but there's this thing called economics. <laughs> so please learn all about economics and what makes sense for your business and what, how you're going to be able to give your customers the value and the quality that they're looking for and not drive yourself crazy as a business owner. Mm, okay. So made in America sounds great. And, and some consumers may care about it, but think about the entire value chain, not just the FOB plus the shipping, the handling all the way up until the consumers and then see which path makes the most sense for the business. That's exactly it. Yeah. And like I said, if you're making like supplements or skincare product, like yeah. easy peasy, you know, we can do that all day, but if you have a lot of components, think about it. Okay. So it sounds like you don't manufacture everything in the U S it's just the one part that is okay. So everything else is kind of import it and then you assemble kit. And then and then send to your Amazon warehouse. Do you also have your own website or other channel sales? Yeah, so we do sell on our own website. We also sell on Amazon, on Walmart, in small retailers, brick and mortar retailers, as well as um, TikTok. Oh, cool. Okay. How how is the process of expanding? A lot of the sellers that I interact with, they start as just 100 Amazon sellers. What would be your recommendation if they're considering maybe expanding to their own website or TikTok or, or these other channels that you discussed? You know, I hear this all, I get this question all the time as a consultant, you know, working with thousands of brands, I get this question all the time, like, Amy, should yeah. I like, I really want to expand to Amazon Europe or I want to do this or I want to do that. And it's like, okay, what I always recommend is start with your primary channel. And how do you choose a primary channel? Number one, you always have to, answer the question like why is somebody going to buy from me on this channel instead of from my competitors right and so you you should always know the answer to that question so when i was doing the market research for my product uh the litter box cleaner i learned that people like to buy pet products on in major retailers right they're not going to buy there unless you're you have a huge marketing budget you know, like starting up a Shopify store, if you're selling cat litter, for example, good luck. Like you're competing with giants and you're also think about the consumer behavior. They really want to buy on Walmart, Amazon, some major channel that they trust for a product like that. So that's the first thing I see a lot of people like, oh, Amy, I'm going to put so much money into my Shopify store. And it's like, okay, you're going to spend a lot of money on traffic and ads. And how do you know that people aren't just going to go to Amazon and look for a similar product and just buy from your competitor? If you're yeah. selling toothbrushes, <laughs> if you're selling bamboo toothbrushes, why are they going to buy it from your Shopify store? You yeah. have to know the consumer behavior when it comes to your product. You need to study that. You need to understand how the 
consumers making a purchasing decision for your type of product. And there's yeah. tons of data out there for you to understand that. So that's the first thing. So build out your primary channel. I think every brand should have a website. Do I think you have to sell on that website? No, but you should have a professional looking website and it should represent your brand. You should also set up all of your social media channels and at least own the alias on those channels. Why? Because you don't want somebody else owning your alias. You know, you don't want somebody else setting up your your product or your brand name on Instagram and now destroying your brand reputation. So from the very beginning I teach, set up your website, set up your alias on all the social media platforms. I don't need you to necessarily build up, build them all out, but you need to own that spot. Yeah. Then choose your primary channel based on consumer behavior and how people, so many people don't know their market. They do not understand their consumer. They do not understand their market. Like that is key. Um, so understand your consumer and then go show up where they are and make sure that your offer on wherever they are, whether that's Amazon or Walmart or whatever, or your own website, uh, make sure your offer is a compelling offer that tells them why they should buy from you and not, you know, answers the question, is this for me? Right. Um, so that's, that's key. Then once you have your primary channel built out and everything's going well, then you can start kind of, you'll, you get some data. You'll understand like, okay, what are the ages of people that buy from me? You know, what are the keywords that I'm selling on? How are people searching for this product? What's the feedback that I'm getting? And then you can start kind of understanding, you know, Amazon gives you global um, expansion tools. You can start understanding, okay, where else could I go? So I always recommend starting expanding your primary market first. So if you're selling in the US, for example, maximize, let's say Amazon's your primary channel, maximize that channel first then start moving to a secondary channel that makes sense, right? Um, it's easy to list your products on eBay, on Wayfair, on whatever other channel, you know, walmart.com, target.com. It's easy to list your products on those channels without a lot of overhead. Um, and then you can just fulfill them through Amazon's own multi-channel fulfillment or through your 3PL. Um, so that's an easy way to expand. Um, yeah. always think about the overhead work that's required with that expansion. We actually pulled our products from walmart.com. They're only listed as merchant fulfilled now because the overhead that was required and the costs were more than the sales volume we were getting from that channel. Yeah. I've actually heard that from a couple of other sellers. I'm really curious. And so our demographics are pet parents in this community. So what would be... Would you be able to share some learnings of how pet parents shop on Walmart versus Amazon? Well, I think it definitely depends on the product and the mindset. Um, I think that in general, we have to think about e-commerce versus in-store. Hmm. So I know me as a pet parent, I, when I shop online, it's for those convenience items, right? Maybe I buy a, a toy for my pet on Amazon or, you know, but I'm not really going to walmart.com to buy those things. Walmart.com is not a primary shopping channel for me. Um, okay. Some people are, Walmart is growing there, yeah. but the level of the volume yeah. of um, those clicks and buys on walmart.com is just lower. But we think about in store, right? Mm -hmm. So if we go in store, I buy cat litter in store all the time. Like it's great because I'm right there. I can pick it up. I also buy pet carriers in the store because I want to look at them. I want to see what they look okay, like. Right? Yeah, you know, you buy your pet food a lot of times in the store and not necessarily um, online, right? Because you you have a trusted brand, you know, whatever. Um, so I would think about that if you're a pet business. Really think about how do you shop? Right. Do you shop on walmart.com to buy, you know, whatever, right? Do you shop on Amazon and for what types of products? Um, there's also tons of data like Nielsen has a lot of consumer data that you can access. If you're in the US, you can go to your public library and access a database called Reference USA that will tell you so much information about local businesses. Um, you could reach out to like local pet retailers. You can get a lot of information. Um, you can look at a lot of data that you'd normally have to pay for uh, a lot of like the Nielsen reports, stuff like that. 
Um, so I would just say, utilize your resources, understand your consumer. And, um, and if you don't do it, chances yeah. are your other pet parents that are, you know, dog, cat parents, whatever, they're probably not doing it either. So go where they are. And if nothing else, you know, if you have an audience, if you've got a social media following, you know, ask them, say, Hey, we're thinking about launching on this channel. Is this exciting for you? Would you, you know, would you buy from this channel? It's great to get that feedback. Yeah. And a lot of the times launching or doing some experiments to observe actual data could be super interesting too. I, I launched a pet memorial brand. It's, it's, it's very niche and it's very different from other, you know, pet categories. And we launched thinking, okay, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna sell to vets. It, it makes so much sense. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah. Pets would, vets would be the, the primary channel, but then we launch and we're like, wow, actually 99% of our traffic is coming from Amazon because people like, first of all, vets don't really want to carry memorial products. It's like a conflict of interest. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give this injection to a pet. And then, you know, I would want to sell my urn. So it's like, wow. Okay. So it, it, it made a lot of sense after we started testing and started, you know, bringing our products to the vets. And it turns out that actually Amazon and crematories and funeral homes are our predominant channels. So I think it's super interesting just to, just to launch it quick and dirty and then see what happens as well. Yeah. And you could also, um, run ads, right? So right. that's an easy way to test is Pinterest is a great place to run ads. Um, mm -hmm. so let's say that you, um, were going to launch on a new channel, you know, whatever you could, or a new product, you could always run a really cheap Pinterest ad with a pro with a photo of that product. Now with AI, you can mm -hmm. mock up a great, you know, idea or a picture of the product you're thinking of launching and you can run super cheap ads and just see like to a landing page of, you know, and just see how much traffic you get. And if there's any interest, um, we had a, a inventor, Marcy McKenna, I believe her name is she, um, and she's an inventor as well as she has uh, her own show on home shopping network. She's a big Amazon seller. And that's what she does before she launches a new product. She, Ooh launches on, she puts an ad on Pinterest and she sees what the traffic is. And that tells her like, if it's going to be successful on the major um, e-commerce channels and it's super cheap to do. That's so true. Now with the ease of social media ads, I'm going to look into that and try that. And, and it sounds like TikTok shop is something that a lot of sellers are now prioritizing. Yeah, you know, it's, it is the TikTok shop is the easiest way to organically rank your products on Amazon, actually. Um, and it's a really highly growing channel. Now, I would say definitely look at the data. So there's really great um, platforms like Fast Moss. Um, I forgot what the other one, I think it's like Coco or something um, where that tell you what's selling on TikTok shop. So look at your competitor's products, just like you would, if you were going to launch on Amazon, you would look and see, you know, what's the data. Um, so look at that, um, and make sure that you think about your product and whether or not it's really demonstrable by influencers. Um, and then, you know, launching on TikTok shop is pretty easy there. The fees are super low. Um, you can reach out to influencers and send them samples. There's an affiliate portal built right into TikTok shop. Um, so it's a really cool way to grow a brand and grow a product. And it's also a great opportunity if you don't have a product yet, or if you're expanding your line or thinking about expanding your line, doing something that's, uh, that's viral and in demand on TikTok shop. It's like Amazon was in 2015 when you could literally launch just right. about any product that people were looking for and it would just fly off the shelves. Um, so that is something to consider for TikTok shop as well. Like even if you don't have, um, a product yet, or you're, you're not sure you have a product, but it's not a good fit for TikTok shop, like actually launching something that's easy to source. Uh, that's good for TikTok shop could really grow your company fast and drive a lot of organic traffic to your brand. What are your thoughts on the future of TikTok in the U.S. and how would that how is that determining the level of effort you put into TikTok? 
you know, I get this question a lot because I have a, I'm a TikTok shop partner and I have a, a course on TikTok shop teaching people how to launch on TikTok shop. Uh, I also have a free masterclass, like a two hour masterclass right. teaching you everything about TikTok shop. Um, so <laughs> I went to prosper the other day and went into the TikTok shop booth and stayed there for about two hours answering questions because the TikTok shop people could not answer them. Anyway, <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> it's like, can I, can I get a check? TikTok? No, they're, they're wonderful. I've really enjoyed working with the team over there and uh, learn, have learned a lot, um, about TikTok, but, um, my background is military. Um, I spent uh, 18 years in the United States Air Force. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was a war planner. So I kind of understand how things work in terms of politics and different right. um, regions and things like that. Um, and so I can tell you that in terms of this TikTok ban, um, this is to me is just politics. This is par for the course, right? It's the same thing we went through when Trump did the Trump tariffs in China and everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, it's so expensive to source my products there now. Um, TikTok is not going to be banned. What's going to happen is there's going to be some political fun, a little shuffling up, a little ruffling of the feathers and, you know, they may be forced to sell to another company, but there's so many ways for them to jump, you know, there's so many loopholes or so many things they can do. Um, so yeah, TikTok's not going anywhere. You know, Americans would be up in arms if that happened. Um, but there's just going to be some, some ruffles. There's going to be some waves that are going to happen. And this hap this kind of stuff happens all the time. Right. And if we compared it, if we compared it to Facebook or any of the other things that have happened, like look at Twitter with Elon Musk and X and, <laughs> You know, all these things. And then, you know, the 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 role that those social media platforms have played in like political elections. And now we think about AI with deep fakes and everything else, like how all of this is gonna evolve. So really TikTok being banned is like the least of my worries. I think it's just going to we're just gonna have a little dance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and things are going to work themselves out. And uh, yeah, I don't think sellers have anything to worry about there. Okay. That's a hot take right there. <laughs> and I must ask, how do you do it all? You have, you, you're so successful. It sounds like in everything you do in terms of team building, hiring, how, yeah. What, what, what's your key to success? Um, really honestly being organized systems and processes. So I run all four of my companies with three people from the Philippines <laughs> <laughs> and these three people are absolutely amazing. Um, okay. I have an, an executive assistant that, um, checks all my email, does my calendar scheduling. You've met my, my assistant. He yeah. handles everything. He's got the keys to the kingdom, right? Okay. Um, but you know, he kind of is my project manager. He does so much, you know, um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for everything he does. Um, but, um, so yes, that the first thing is getting rid of your email. If okay. you are stuck in your inbox every day and so many entrepreneurs are, you're yeah. gonna, you're gonna go down hard because <laughs> you're not going to be able to grow. You're going to yeah. be stuck every day trying to clean out the inbox and the emails are just going to keep coming. And I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs come to me for consulting and they're like, Amy, I'm dying, but I can't get rid of my email because I can't trust someone else to answer an email like I would. So I've got one hot tip for you there. If you struggle with giving up your email and your calendar and all those things, you need to read the book, Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. You need to read it. He gives you the exact formula that you need to use and the confidence to use it. And I've recommended that book to so many people and they've said the same thing. Um, so buy back your time by Dan Martell. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is do a time analysis, right? right. There's a book uh, by Mike Michalowicz called Clockwork, where he yeah. talks about, you know, how do you build systems? How do you understand like what, what you even need to hire for? Uh, and Dan, uh, Dan also addresses that in buy back your time. But you need to do a time analysis to understand how you're spending your time and understand how you can build out systems for that and what you should hire for. Um, so that really, 
has been my biggest growth as an entrepreneur is understanding how to buy back my time right. so that I can travel and I can do all the things I love to do. Um, but I can trust that things are getting done and I can continue to grow so that that's it. And then also just understanding how to manage your team. So many people, I like all my people are from the Philippines. Um, and so many people ask me like, where did you find your people? Where did you, how did you find these great three people from the Philippines? Like I want to find people like that. And I tell them it has literally nothing to do with where I found them and everything to do with how I communicate with them, how I, you know, work with them, how I treat them. So we do sync meetings once a week. Um, we are always communicating. We have a chat where we communicate our, our KPIs every day. Um, we have a weekly sync meeting where we go over our, my, I go over my priorities for the week. And then, you know, they talk about each of their priorities uh, in, in turn, we, we sync with each other. Um, I tell them all the time how much I appreciate them. Uh, I take good care of them. And that's a big thing is like people often will hire a VA from the Philippines, for example, and they'll just expect them to know what to do. Yeah. No training, like just know what to do. And I don't want to talk to you. You just do your thing. Here's your login. Uh, go figure it out. You know, that's the worst thing you could do. Would you want to work for somebody like that? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't, you would not want to work for someone that never talks to you, that doesn't grow you. So all my people, we, we teach AI, we teach them how to use AI. We challenge each other like, Hey, how can we, you know, increase this productivity? How can we sell more of this? How can we do more of this? How can we learn this? You know, we're always working together to be better together. And I, I think that that's the best advice I can give you guys is just, um, make sure you're hiring for the right reasons to buy back your time and also make sure you, you are setting up systems and processes to, to make your team feel productive and hold them accountable, hold each other accountable um, so that you can grow. I really love the lesson there. It's, it's obviously the people themselves are so important too. So it's important to identify the talent but a lot of the times it's important to set up an environment for success, to set these people up for success. Yeah, completely. And, and it's not like I've always been great at it. You know, a lot of times, you know, I look at my background, right. And I was an operations manager for my cyber team in the air force and all of that. And you would think, you know, I've been through all these military leadership schools. You would think I would just in my own business, I would just have it all figured out. Right. And a lot of people come from these big corporate environments and they start their own business and they're like, I'm a mess. I don't know how to pay myself. I don't know how to hire people. I don't know how to train them. I feel like a complete yeah. loser, a complete failure. You know, yet I came from this job where I managed a team of a hundred people and I did this and I did this. And you gotta give yourself grace because it's not like you it's like having a baby. It doesn't come with a freaking manual, right? You're having a business baby. It doesn't come with a manual. It's going to take time to learn how to pay yourself, to learn how to hire people, to, you know, if you go into it with a mindset of have fun, like my mantra is enjoy the journey. Whenever I get to a point where I'm like, man, I'm not enjoying this, then I stop and go, okay, wait, what's going on here? Because I didn't, I didn't get into this to hate it every day. I'm, what do I need to do to get back to like having fun, enjoying the journey, giving myself grace? Um, so that's, you know, that's my life coach hat, my life coach hat on and and just kind of remind people that it's okay. You didn't know any of these things when you started your business and all these things have to be learned. And, um, and it's just about having that fun learning mindset of, of that, you know, of curiosity and everything that made you be creative and start your business in the first place and, and giving yourself the grace to grow and get there. Yeah. Wow. That's, I think that's so inspiring. I, I echo that. I graduated business school, um, at Wharton two years ago. And I had moved from Taiwan to, to Philly thinking, okay, I'm going to do my two years of MBA and then I'm going to graduate and then I'm going to become the successful businessman woman. <laughs> um, and then what happens is that business school teaches you how to, how to think strategically and, and, and interact with academic material and then translate that into, into the real world. But it really doesn't teach you, you know, how do you even, like what are what are all the accounting systems to use for your business? How do you start an LLC? What are what are the write-offs 
of, of your expenses, like all these nitty gritty things, a lot of them come with experience too. So I think it's super inspiring. Um, this, this session, I, I think obviously you've done so much to become, to, to get to where you are today, but it sounds like a lot of it is also, is also the grit to keep going and also the discipline to set up these systems so that your talent can thrive too, to help you get where you are. You nailed it. That's exactly it. You know, failure is just a stepping stone. And I have had plenty of failures. I've had plenty of failed products. Uh, I've had failed businesses, business ventures that I've started. I've had things that haven't worked out. You know, when AI became really popular, a huge source of my income was copywriting and all my copywriting orders went out the window. You know, I was hosting China trips and all of a sudden the pandemic came and I pivoted to online courses. You know, I've done tons of things that, you know, if I had it to do over again, I would do that differently. And, you know, I think it's important for us all to remember that our failures are simply just stepping stones. They're learning. And how lucky are we that we are on this side of the coin and we realize that we can create anything we want to create. And money is absolutely infinite. We can always make more of it. We can't take it with us when we die, right? And, you know, just have fun. And I love it. And what you said about, um, you know, Wharton Business School, are you kidding me? Like, why aren't you already a billionaire? What? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, are you kidding me? Amazing. So, you know, it it doesn't give us all the, all the pieces to the puzzle. It's, it's about the journey. And if we can just have fun and have an attitude of gratitude and learning and always be curious and, uh, you know, then, Hey, aren't we having fun? Like, this is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Amazing at home. (laughs) It all makes so much sense. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. I think this is, just the first conversation of many to come. I think I think you would be a great resource to our community, especially to these pet parents, pet lovers who are looking to to change the world um, for the better for our for our fur babies. So, if our audience would like to find you, Amy, what would be the best way? Sure. Um, so I am amazing at home on nearly all the platforms. We have a YouTube yeah. channel. We have, um, you know, our website, amazingathome.com. If you want to take our free TikTok masterclass where we show you all about TikTok shop, you can go to amazingathome.com forward slash TikTok. Okay. Um, so, you know, happy to help. Amazing at home on all the platforms. Uh, amazingathome.com is my website. Um, and you know, you can always, always find me, Amy Weiss on, on LinkedIn or fa- I'm pretty active on Facebook too. If you want to okay. check out any of my health and wellness stuff, um, Ooh, I share great. a lot of that on, on Facebook. Um, but yeah, happy to connect. I love this. I love connecting with other entrepreneurs on this journey. Um, I wouldn't be where I am or where I'm going without all mm-hmm. of the amazing people I've connected with, including you Elsa. thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Amy.